right. So as I mentioned, oh, where did it go? Can you see the, nope, wrong one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it looks like that. Here we go. Okay. No. Can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. Um, just trying to resize my screen here for a second. So I'm going to be fairly informal and leave it just in this view. Um, but as I mentioned, <clears throat> reading Andy Grove's book, uh, Chad held it up for us. You can do that again if you've got a handy Chad. But so far, awesome book. And chapters four and five I listened to on my commute today, and they were on meetings and decision making. So that's where this is coming from. And I want to just list out some of the things that, and that the book is teaching me in terms of how best to manage meetings, when to call them, et cetera, and then a framework for making decisions inside your company. So I'm going to summarize just what um, is in the book and share some of my thoughts, but I would much rather have everybody else either throwing stuff in the chat or just unmuting yourself and sharing your experiences. Um, but the book talks about two different types of meetings. And it was interesting to me to hear um, the author, Andy Grove, for those who may not know him, he was the third CEO of Intel. Um, and did an amazing job at Intel building the company. Um, but he says that he likes meetings, which is, I think, a bit of an anomaly in the current environment. But there are a few reasons he likes them. First off, though, he defines two different types of meetings that he will call. They were process-driven meetings and mission-driven meetings. Defining the process driven is those th top three on this list. So one on one staff meetings and operational reviews. And then the mission oriented said, he said that should be only about 25% of the meetings that you call. So diving into the process oriented one, the one on one meetings, that's just a manager and a staff member. And the intent there, um, got to pull up my notes here just a second. Um, the intent there is to have the staff member, not the manager, driving the meeting and setting the agenda. Um, one interesting part that I thought in the book was assigning a meeting chair, a chairperson, and that is who is in charge of taking notes, setting the agenda, I think just an efficient way of, of holding a meeting. Um, but the one-on-ones are the main purpose is uh, teaching and an exchange of information. Um, so that's kind of the other process oriented is the exchange of information. And uh, these are to bring up what they call thorny issues between the staff member and the manager, and they are, are meant to cover the important and not urgent, meaning they're more longer term rather than there's a fire to put out, we need to have a meeting about it. The mission oriented are more ad hoc and um, the dri they're driving toward a decision. So that's where, um, he talks about why he likes meetings and what he does in them. So there are these three points that he said are the purpose for him to have a meeting. And that's the information gathering, the decision-making, and then the nudging. And as he talks about being a manager, because it's a management book, he talks about nudging people in the right direction rather than just telling them what to do, uh, micromanaging them. And so thinking about how you do each one of these in a meeting is the work 
of the meeting. And he considered, I liked how he framed meetings as you're actually working in the meeting. You're not just showing up and glazing over and the intent for all employees is that you're going to a meeting to work. So be proactive in the meeting, giving your giving information, helping make decisions, etc. cetera. Um, and then this is the last one on the, the left is what changed on this slide, the text there. Um, those are the questions that he suggested you go through. If you're the meeting chair, you're calling the meeting, um, making sure you understand all of these and can answer yes to all of those questions in the left blue box, like what you're going to accomplish. Is it necessary? Um, can you justify calling a meeting and having um, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars spent? He went through the exercise, which I'm sure many of you have heard, where when you've got a meeting of 10 people in the room, if you just take kind of an average hourly rate of all the people, the cost of that meeting gets to the point where typically if someone in the company were going to spend that amount of money, they would have to go through two or three levels of approval to spend a thousand, two thousand dollars. So think about that when you're calling a meeting and preparing for a meeting that you should go through that kind of same approval process in your mind of um, the desired outcome of the meeting. So that's what I learned on the meeting side of the chapter. I won't jump into the decision making side yet, but wanted just to open it up and say and ask a few questions of um, how you all set agendas, like what you think about when you're calling a meeting, how you run a meeting, how have you seen a meeting be effectively executed? Um, so this is the time to share and talk together. I'll stop sharing the slides so we can more easily see each other in the conversation. So examples of meetings that you've been in that have, that have been effective and how do you avoid non-effective meetings just unmute yourself I'll, I'll start it off with something i've been using recently that's been super useful is uh, just an agenda um it's crazy how many meetings i went to where i was like looking at the person being like i think i know why we're here but we're going to spend five minutes making sure that we both are here for the same reason um but sending over that agenda ahead of time uh, has allowed some meetings to be canceled, has allowed for some meetings to completely be about different things, or just given us the appropriate jumping off point headspace to, to share and collaborate in a more effective way. Um, so that's been my most recent tip outside of uh, some of the things you mentioned and some of the things in this book that uh, should, is on the to read list. Have you, is it ever difficult for you to identify who the meeting chair should be, the one who sends out the agenda or who should be in charge of it or driving it? Yeah, in my position, like in my I should be driving most meetings um, as a relationship oriented like leader. It's like I'm, I'm typically the one establishing the meeting or setting up the context. Um, if not, like if someone's booking time on my calendar, I typically am able to ask a few clarifying questions ahead of time that allow for something to be established of like what the point is. Um, so internally, I think I do find that problem happening often because, you know, especially there's multiple people that make or have input on multiple decisions. And um, sometimes it's just really like there's a default person and if they're unavailable, there's someone else gets tapped and that, that person's intended to lead. But there's always a, um, I think the, the best meetings that I've been a part of has someone who's supposed to sheer, steer the ship, uh, keep us on task or bring bring tangents back to the core topic. Um, additionally, I find that person excels when they're able to reframe the conversation over and over again, back to the central point or the central problem or the central idea um, because tangents are great and that's where a lot of good thoughts come from. But if they're too far, too, too divergent from the core theme, then you might as well be in a different meeting. Awesome. 
awesome experience. Thanks for sharing that, Maxwell. I would second that. I would have to say often as I have had it happen a few times as I've put, been putting together the agenda for a meeting that I was responsible for, I found out I wrote out the agenda and connected with a few individual people. I realized oh, we don't actually need a meeting. I just needed to send up a good project update and I needed to connect with these two people when I had been thinking that this was going to require a meeting of all eight people. That's a useful exercise, even if it doesn't end up being an actual agenda. So true. I really like, uh, I'm glad you brought up the point about money, dollars, you know, how many people are sitting in this room. Saturday, my wife and I, she's a vice president for a blood bank here where we live. And uh, they had an outing for their, for their, for their company at the baseball game. We got there. The, it's a, it was a white caps game. It should have been a white caps game. Well, it was a, uh, some ha thunder hammer or something like that. They didn't, they didn't even know that, um, that there was the same team. They just renamed the team for that Saturday. It was like, so they had all, and I asked myself, I, I asked my wife sitting next to me, I said, who was involved in buying these tickets? And she said, uh, marketing and a couple of the people from Wisconsin. I said, how many people do you think? She says, oh, there had to be six or seven people in that meeting. I think, how many people, how much you think they make? And she, and she said, not nah, one of them made less than a hundred grand. And they couldn't get that right, you know? And they called the meeting. For, and, I, and that was just one meeting. I wonder how many meetings they had you know, up until the decision, the time they made the decision to buy the tickets. I love that. I've walked out of meetings as a project manager. I've walked out of meetings or told people to leave meetings because they weren't invited because people just feel like they're supposed to be there and people need, you know, they need to hear their two cents, you know? Yep. So true. Any other, any other thoughts or comments on the meeting side? When have you seen an effective meeting? What were the elements in it? And how do you avoid not having productive meetings? So I have some thoughts. We do a lot of uh, like stand-ups and they're 15 minute stand-ups. And I think they're good for the information gathering and coordination. Um, I think we overuse them. And if you do them like every day, sometimes they get a little monotonous and repetitive. But I, I don't know the correct cadence for that. They're useful, but they're not always useful. So I'm curious to hear what other people have to, have to say. Yeah, I'm thinking in the same way. Um, I got a piece of marriage counseling advice once. Uh, my wife and I took a little course and they were talking about complaining. And the, the therapist said like the only reason you should ever bring up something to complain is if you're going to make a specific request of the other party and I really like that and so if like you're not willing to come out and say the awkward thing of like I need you to please do this then just get over it and don't bring it up because it's one or the other and so applying that to meetings it's like I think people need to be heard and people want to be valued but if you can say like it's a it's an opportunity to make a specific request of people and I ask myself that going into a meeting what am I actually asking of them? Like, just listen to me or hear what I'm saying. Like, it, it kind of makes me get to the chase a little bit better. Um, so. That's awesome, Weston. Um, Nate, I also put in the chat kind of the quote that I had on the, from the book from, uh, about how to decide when to have a meeting. So I don't, I don't know if this applies to standups um, it seems like it could, but maybe you only call a stand up when you can answer yes to all of those questions. That's the intent of what they said in the book, but I don't know. You know, it all, I think it all depends on what, I mean, so, um, when I project manage, it was in, it, we were doing interior design, custom interior design. So there's a lot of carpentry, you know, um, and so we'd have bench meetings every day, you know, just to check. Instead of having a meeting, I would get in the morning and go see how's everything going. Did we get everything accomplished we were talking about yesterday? Check, you know, or they'd come to see me. Um, and that, man, that, that in itself, uh, that freed up a lot of time for everybody to keep working and not take up an hour and a half of somebody's time in the beginning of the, the production meeting in the beginning of uh, the morning. Yeah, no, I just to second that, I think um, when we used to meet, in person more for work instead of virtually it was easier to do um, 
what they called MWA, which was management by walking around. And you could check <laughs> in on people without having a meeting. You could you know, say, hey, you know, over, look over somebody's shoulder. How's this project going or whatever? And, and there was a different sort of um, social interaction. But it, I think there are some of those things that, that we can substitute with impromptu meetings, like whether they're Slack huddles or um, you know, just hopping on a phone call or even asynchronous things like the conversations we have on text or Slack. Um, I like standups if they're actually short, right? Like by the end of 15 minutes, the standups like feeling like I'm thinking more about still standing than I am actually, you know, uh, whatever the topic is of the meeting. But and I like them uh, if they're spinoffs of like like uh, if you do Scrum like I've done marketing Scrum for marketing teams for a long time and I like a, a daily Scrum where everybody's you know a quick review of their projects. But um, anyway, just a couple of comments to to dogpile on um, what Ken was saying. There's a tool I used in project management called a RAID log. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. So RAID log acronym. So it has four different categories. So R is risk and then assumptions, issues, and dependencies. And I use that for uh, taking notes in meetings, but also just keeping track of a project. And I think there's lots of things that apply as projects besides instruction management. But in all of the meetings that I was in, I always updating that RAID log, whether it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting or it was the full team meeting whoever was attending it, I was keeping track of that raid log. And uh, because I'm noting who, I mean, it was basically the notes of a meeting generally was updating what changes have happened to a risk, what changes have happened to the assumptions we're making. And that was a good way of keeping track of a complex project and the status of all of these different moving parts that were happening. And so by that being available to one to check on and also um, a tool that I could go back to to see who needed to be followed up on. I could see was this how many things connect and are worth bringing people together, or how many things can be taken care of asynchronously or with a one on one. You know, Sarah, you made me think about one other thing. I think this also related to what Maxwell had said earlier. Um, and that is, if you think about meetings, it's not just the bookends of the meeting, but there's like pre-work before the meeting. Sometimes that has to do with making assignments or having conversations with key stakeholders in the meeting. And then you have the meeting. And then a lot of times there's the meeting after the meeting, which is where you circle up with everybody and make sure, you know, okay, these guys are on board, these guys are on board. I think viewing a meeting as, as kind of like, that's the most expensive sort of single event, but there's a lot you can do before and after the meeting to help make sure that it's successful. It depends on how big the meeting is too. Like that's a little overkill for a, Stand up, but if you're, you know, if you have a one other, issue, one other thing that we always keep a, a track of are our, our, our action items, open items, anything that's open, anything that we don't have an understanding of, we keep a list of that, and that's one of the things that we discuss. Those meetings never lasted more than five minutes, and if they did, they were usually talking about somebody's family or something, you know, wondering how they were doing. It's a, it's an information gathering. That's it because I'm out on the floor for 25 minutes and I want to get as much as I can done in that time. And if they need to come up by me, they can come up by me. But that action items list is uh, is priceless. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I want to I want to keep our timing to 11:45. Uh, I'm trying to be true to Midday Connect being short and sweet. So I'm going to share my screen again and then just go through what I learned on the decisions. Um, so there are um, several questions that Andy uses as a, or Andy used as a framework for making a decision. And these also are, are part of the meetings as well. This helps drive who needs to come to the meeting, um, who needs to be informed by it. Um, so CMO Zen and Chad have also helped us understand the, the RACI framework, R-A-C-I. I think I have to spell that every time I say it just to make sure that we all know that it's a business term, um, but it's kind of who answering a lot of these questions. So as you are in a meeting and having to make a decision or just in general, going through these 
will help refine how and who makes them. The, the quote here from the book um, I thought was really interesting where it was about pushing decision-making down to the correct level of person in the company to make the decision. And how they said decisions need to be made by someone with a technical understanding as and um, past experiences. He talked about how managers at Intel, as they've been there for their whole career, became less and less in touch with the technical um, or the technology of the time. And so they became, they kind of aged themselves out of relevance with the technology, but their past experience was also helpful. So you had to bring in a couple of different types of people to be able to make a good decision um, that was allowing the company to continue to innovate, but also leveraging the experience of the people inside. Um, so any, any questions, comments about this framework and these questions, like what decisions needing to be made, who, when, how, um, how that works? Have you seen this work well or not work well? What have your, your, what have your experiences been? I want to talk about that for maybe four or five more minutes and then we, and then we'll be done. I think one of the, one of the challenges of this is making sure that everybody's bought into their role. There's often people who are informed that think they should be consulted or at the end of it, they are like, Hey, why, why wasn't I consulted? Um, so I think having that, that institutional buy-in that like, this is actually your role here. Um, and this is what it all means. So at the end of the project, we're not coming back and saying, Hey, why, why wasn't I consulted? It's like, okay, well, you're on the informed track and here's the consulted. And, uh, Sometimes that takes a little bit of time and trust building and, and understanding what the, the the walls are behind those different roles. Um, but yeah, just making it really clear, like what does informed mean? Does it mean that I come to you and I say, hey, here's the direction we're going to go. Are you good with this? Or does it mean, hey, this is this is the direction we've gone, just an FYI. So I think that role definition is really important for people. Jordan, have you found a good time and way of defining those? Whether, I mean... Because you're right, some people may think they should be consulted when they should be informed or whatever, and it might be offensive to them by saying, hey, you're just on the informed track. Have you found a good way or a time to do that in a project or when a decision is needing to be made? I, I think it depends. So uh, I'm thinking back to an experience we had where we're the marketing team, we have the, the VP of sales. There's always some natural friction there. Um, and I think that it works it worked pretty well to let them be consulted for most things until they had the trust that they could move to inform. Like, I don't think they actually wanted to be in consulted for everything, but didn't really like they, they were new. They didn't really know what we were doing. They didn't really know how our process worked. And so I think it was okay to keep them as consulted, but we kind of like over time and consistency, it was like, you, you don't need to be part of this. Like you have, you have better things to do with your time and we're doing this for you. It's not for us to like put our arms around everything and want to own it. We're doing it so that you can feel like you're being freed up to do things that you're great at and trust the people who are great at that. So I think there's an element of consistency. Um, and I think it's, I, I think it's okay to let people early on as you're building those relationships of trust to maybe play different roles uh, unless you really feel like it's slowing down the org. I think it's okay. I'm so glad we're recording this because I want to take that snippet of what you just said and use that in training and onboarding in our company. So awesome. Thank you. Other thoughts, questions, comments before we wrap up? I did put the presentation, just if you want it, in the chat. You can download it. It's very simple. You can also Google a better summary of Andy Grove's books online. But um, if you want to use this as a, hey, team, here's a presentation I just listened to, it could be a catalyst for the conversation that Jordan just suggested having. Um, but use it as, as you want. Any final comments or, or thoughts before we close up shop for the day? 
so awesome to have you all here. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, make sure you reach out and connect with everybody who you've met here and let us all know if there's anything that we should be doing different in the Midday Connect.